Not at the studio with Kitchen Theory, we have Steve Keller. Steve is, a, uh, is the Sonic Strategy Director for Studio Resonate at Pandora. He's also a TED speaker and a close friend who uh, has become kind of a, a multi-sensory um, advocate over the years and has helped us at Kitchen Theory with designing all of the soundscapes and the audio design behind the experience. Uh, that we have at our chef's table. Steve, it's such a pleasure to have you, um, well, not at the studio, but to have you on the show. Um, before we kind of get into this and talk about some of the kind of um, work that we've done together and some of the research that you've worked on, just to give people a bit of an idea on what is it that got you interested in the multisensory aspects of uh, flavor, uh, of, sorry, sound and how that relates to flavor and what is it that took you down that route? Well, you know, I've, I've lived long enough that I have quite a few stories. Let me try and condense it uh, <laughs> in a way that'll make it uh, interesting uh, and as short as possible for the listeners out there. Um, you know, I have a, a wide variety of, of interests, but, um, you know, I would say that my, my main passions uh, are certainly uh, uh, music and sound. Uh, it's been a part of my life since I was a kid taking piano lessons at an early age. Uh, picking up a guitar, writing songs in high school because it was a great way to meet girls. Um, but I never thought about, about that as a career. Um, and so when I went to university, um, I studied psychology. I was really interested in how the, the human mind works, interested in personality, also in perception. Um, and uh, graduated from university, was uh, getting ready to go on and do my master's and, and PhD when... Uh, music picked back up again and I decided to take a little detour and instead of heading to grad school I headed to Nashville uh, which here in the states we call it Music City USA um, and uh, very quickly found that uh, I had a, a knack for production uh, that led to me kind of working with uh, a lot of very talented people in Nashville putting music together working on albums and one of the things that I did was work on uh, music for commercials. Uh, and through that experience found that I just really loved advertising and, and, and branding. And in 2005, those passions came together. I started my own company, kind of working with brands to uh, help them understand how to harness the, the power of sound from a psychological perspective uh, to help them uh, create uh, brand identities from a sonic perspective and also thinking about experience. So what does, just for people who aren't aware, what's a brand identity from a sonic perspective? Like what's that in well, layman's terms? How would people understand in the, what that the, the, the easy examples are, are things like sonic logos, which, you know, a sonic logo is to your ear what a visual logo is to your eye. So Intel has these series of notes when we hear them, bum, 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 bum. We recognize, oh, that's Intel or T-Mobile, ba da 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 da, or McDonald's, yeah. ba da bum bum bum. Uh, you could also look at functional sounds. You know, when you uh, start up your your computer, is there a sound that's associated with that? When there's a notification that comes in, um, there are sounds associated mm. with that. Even automotive uh, companies, automobiles, they work on tuning their engines, tuning the exhaust so that you kind of recognize a vehicle um, by its sound. Electric vehicles now have to make a sound because they're not safe. Uh, and so you have brands that are rushing to develop uh, signatures so that, again, when you hear the car, you know, oh, that's a that's a Jaguar or that's an Audi or that, you know, whatever. Oh, that's a whole models. new way of recognizing it because now you maybe recognize them by the taillights or the... Right, the front headlights or whatever it may be that's there, or their their silhouette or whatever it may be. But oh, yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was that uh, combination of things that, in some ways, brought me back into academia, which I which I love. Um, you know, I, I refer to myself as an audio alchemist uh, because I'm often kind of blending sound science and sound art um, in pursuit of sound magic, <laughs> if you will, yeah. and. Uh, so uh, it was through um, a lot of those endeavors um, that I uh, met uh, a fellow by the name of Charles Spence at a conference uh, and uh, just thought he was absolutely brilliant. 
um, and on a, a subsequent visit to um, uh, the UK, uh, met Charles for uh, dinner and uh, friendship formed uh, from there. And then eventually we got to a point where we were um, actually beginning to work on some experiments together. Uh, there was an evening where uh, Charles let me know that there was a, a special multi-sensory restaurant that um, there was an opening and he could get me in if I would like, because I happened to be in London. And I said, sure. And so I went to this uh, event on synesthesia, this place called Kitchen Theory, and met this wonderful chef and his wife, Lulu. And here we are talking on the, uh, uh, you know, during a time of COVID. Uh, and one other thing that I think is really worth mentioning uh, is the fact that um, one of the jobs that I did uh, as I was um, working through uh, being in Nashville was waiting tables. And during that time of waiting tables, I happened to work at a restaurant with an amazing chef in Nashville by the name of Deb Paquette. And Deb taught me um, the, the beauty of food and that there was so much more to it than just, you know, creating the dish. It was how you presented the dish on the plate. It was all the sensory elements that went into it. And while she wasn't a multi-sensory chef, she certainly behaved that way. Uh, and so it's just serendipitous to me that, uh, you know, in the course of my life, I've now been able to kind of re-engage this love and passion for food and tie it into the things that are um, just really wonderful and amazing and and all part of part of my love for this multi-sensory dimension of the world so you mentioned uh meeting charles and that is indeed how uh we met and along the years you have kind of really gotten involved in the actual research itself as well like myself i think you know i came as from being a chef and wasn't in the world of academia met charles and um, again, similar kind of uh, feeling in terms of absolutely amazed by his work, really wanted to find out more. But more than just wanting to learn more, also wanting to in some way be a part of this and contribute towards this. And I can see that that is very much the p angle that you came at it from as well, which was, wasn't just about learning how that these things work, but it was, right, well, th I, I guess it's learning about that stuff just opened up more questions, right? Certainly. Yeah, as I, as I said, you know, I I, I have um, you know these 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 two worlds that I live in, um, both of which I think are are creative, just creative from a different standpoint. This one side of you know the the artistic part of creativity, you know, putting together a, a, a piece of music, you know, or if I were a chef, you know, thinking about how to create uh, a dish in an interesting way. But then the 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 science side of it, which is no less creative. It's really kind of looking at, you know, well, what's behind all of this? Why do things work the way they do? And if I understand that, how can I start having an impact on, well, I change this, I change that, that results in this. Oh, that's interesting. What about this connection? And the deeper I get into those things, you know, there's that part of my personality that's like, you know, I, I very often don't know uh, when I come up with an idea, to what extent is it brilliant and to what extent is it bullshit. Uh, and the science is the piece of it that kind of helps, uh, you know, keep me keep me honest. So I eventually got to a point where, you know, I was like, well, if I'm going to think about these things, talk about these things, work with clients, it's not enough for me to simply have a grasp of the literature. I really want to get my hands and ears uh, into the into the process. Uh, and so that started, uh, you know, I think my first piece of research was uh, around spiciness. You know, I kind of took a look and said, well, what's something that hasn't been researched quite as much? And this idea of the spiciness or the heat in food um, was really interesting. And uh, Charles had introduced me So tell me, me a to, little bit about that. Sure. What would be, what was the research behind that? So for people listening, I guess if they're not used to the idea of uh, kind of how sound relates to flavor in some way, how, what made you think that that could be a possibility? What was it about sound and spiciness or sound and taste or flavor in the first place that kind of put you on that track? 
Well, I, I think, you know, when we, we talk a lot about this idea of cross-modalism, you know, the idea that all of our senses work together, uh, and certainly that's part of Charles's uh, his work, is, is understanding what the relationships are, and if we understand those, can we hack our sensory perception? Um, you know, in, in our case, uh, how could we use sound to affect our other senses? And so when you think about um, some of these cross-modal associations, many of them are very natural. Uh, you know, so we we can think about music in terms of arousal. You know, uh, if, if you think about you know working with a you were you were listening to a band and you said, "Man, that band is hot." It's like, well, in in some ways, that vernacular means that uh, you know they may be the the latest thing out there that everybody's listening to, but it could also have to do with that level of excitement, the intensity that they bring to that experience. And so we think about heat, we think about sound, and it becomes very natural associations when you start thinking about flavor. Uh, and so that was the, the start of it for me. And also, as I said, we, we kind of looked at the research and found that there'd been a lot uh, of, of research around sweetness, um, bitterness, uh, maybe, you know, umami, uh, but not as much uh, around this idea. Of and for people who aren't familiar with, let's say, the, the research in that area, what sure. has it shown? What, what, what is it about spi uh, s sweet and salty and bitter and uh, sour and sure. umami that relates to sound? Or how do they relate to sound? Well, there's, uh, we, you know, we, we call them the sonic seasonings if you will, how do we tease those out? Uh, so the experimental metho methodology uh, very often begins simply with uh, looking at the, what are the sonic building blocks like pitch, tempo, um, consonance, dissonance, um, attack, decay. Uh, these are all things that we have control over as we develop a piece of, of music or sound. Mm -hmm. uh, and we begin by working with an experimental model where we play different varieties of sound and have people just make subjective associations with them. Um, okay. You know, does that, does that sound um, spicy? Uh, and again, because some of these are very natural, uh, these associations start and we're just looking for high degrees of um, significant correlations between certain sounds and flavor associations. Then once we have those, we take those ingredients and then the next step is, okay, can we put these together in a way where now we can run a, an experiment to see what the actual impact is? Uh, and so without going through all the the myriad of details around that, um, you know, what we found in the outcomes ultimately was that using the sonic ingredients for spiciness, which um, we found were uh, a, a faster tempo, higher pitches, um, a little bit of a distortion, uh, fast attack, fast decay, <clears throat> and unsurprisingly, uh, maybe a little bit of a cultural cue. Like instead of a uh, steady, um, like a indigenous North American Indian beat, uh, <clears throat> maybe you would need something that might be more like a um, Brazilian uh, samba or a salsa. Uh, and these cultural cues kind of help, uh, you know, prime our brain. So we put all of these together into a piece of music, tested it, uh, and what we found was that when people, uh, were eating something that had some level of heat to it, uh, you know, some spiciness, uh, the brain seemed to be primed by listening to our spicy soundtrack to uh, have an expectation that what you're eating is going to be spicy. And this is where it gets really interesting because we found that if the food is indeed spicy, this spicy soundtrack is actually magnifying that experience. So okay. the food's spicy, I taste it listening to the soundtrack, and my brain says, wow, that's really spicy. So if you were to ask somebody, you know, how spicy something was when they weren't listening to the soundtrack, they would say, oh, that's spicy. Somebody listening to the spicy soundtrack would say, wow, that's really spicy. But 
if it's only mildly right. spicy, it starts working the other way. You know, our brain is saying, you you should be tasting something that's really spicy. Oh, hmm. Is this really all that spicy? I, oh, I don't think so. And so somebody who's tasting something that's mildly spicy, they would probably rate that as tasting a little spicier than somebody who's listening to the spicy soundtrack whose brain is getting confused because they're expecting it to be much spicier than it's registering. And I think what this teaches us in general is, um, and you know, you know this as you prepare your meals, uh, you're looking at congruence and incongruence. So, you know, either sure. magnifying an experience by putting together all these congruent multisensory aspects of things, or perhaps shocking the system momentarily with something that isn't expected, something that's incongruent. And uh, the, the thing that we have to be careful with is that typically incongruence is not a pleasant experience. And so while, you know, while we might want to have a moment where we shock our system, uh, we don't want that moment to continue on for very long without kind of bringing us to a place of congruence um, or else we will tend to feel really uncomfortable. We'll tend to avoid it. It won't be a pleasant experience. And, uh, you know, you do that too often in your restaurant. You're not going to have customers coming sure. back because, you know, they're, they're not ultimately going to enjoy that experience. So as you were kind of talking there, you got me thinking about how sound, because you were talking about intuitively, you know, that we take maybe these things for granted and how sound works as part of our kind of experience of food. I was thinking about, let's say, this idea of if I say to you, just imagine the sound of uh, sizzling onions in a pan. And you can probably do that in your mind's eye. You can kind of imagine, mm -hmm. and people listening to this can probably imagine in their mind's eye uh, what the sizzling of onion sounds like. But you can't really imagine the smell of it. And it's interesting how you can recall audio cues of food in a way that's probably better than you can in some cases recall the actual, because I guess it's your chemical senses that you associate the flavor and the taste with, and you can't mm -hmm. recall those as well as you can audio cues, right? Right. Yeah, and I think you know you're kind of speaking to the idea of um, maybe evoked memories, uh, and we know that music, in particular, is a very powerful mnemonic device. Um, smell is is probably the most powerful memory trigger, um, and next to it, very close to it, is is music. It's just that with music, we can actually hum back melodies. Whereas with smells, you know, I, I can't sure. just magically make the smell appear unless I'm a synesthete. <laughs> and, and then it could be that I hear something and because my senses really are literally crossed, yeah. I may smell that sound. But most of us aren't, aren't you know, synesthetes in, in the, 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 the true sense of, of the word. However, with a melody... Um, you know, that, uh, that melody will help us remember people, places, things in our lives. Um, you know, we're, we're taught our ABCs, you know, with this little melody that, that we, yeah. we learn. We have these earworms that get in. Uh, and the other powerful thing that's a piece of uh, these musical experiences is the, the drip of dopamine that begins in our brain. You know, and dopamine is this chemical that, uh, you know, it's, it's very addictive, it's, it's very pleasurable, uh, and music is a very powerful like dopamine. Like when you hear your favorite trigger. song and you're charged exactly. up with energy and you're feeling great and you're... It's why, and it's why you like to hear that song over and over again. And the research has shown us you can get to a point where you don't have to actually hear that music. You can imagine it and there's the dopamine the dopamine drip. So these, you know, this is really powerful, um, you know, and, and there are certainly sound and music associations that we have with, with food, um, you know, and e e especially around rituals of food and, and things that we hear 
Uh, and, you know, restaurants, it's one of the reasons why music does play in the background. You know, it's part well, of the I, atmosphere. I wanted to get onto that because you did mention uh, restaurants a moment ago. Yes. So I guess in a way, audio uh, soundscapes and music as a whole, you would consider quite underutilized in most restaurants, right? I guess there are some restaurants that are themed that have maybe a... I'm thinking even if you look at immersive places like maybe Rainforest Cafe, where maybe they have the background of kind of uh, the tropical forest or right. um, there are certain restaurants or dining experiences I've been to that have either chosen to go with no music or something very ambient, or in some cases, it's literally just someone's playlist um, or they're right. trying to theme it. So if it's an Italian restaurant, there's Italian music, uh, right. there's Italian sound and music going on in the background. So where are we missing a trick with this? What, 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 what aren't people really understanding about the proper or the, the potential use of um, audio as a sensory element of really immersing people into a dining experience or in elevating that experience in some way? Yeah, I, I think there are a few things. I think, you know, per, perhaps the first thing which, uh, which you addressed is really the intention. You know, it, it's, it's, thinking about music not simply as a placeholder of something playing in the background but what is our our intention with how it can add to the experience and that might be as simple um as you know hey i'm an italian restaurant playing italian music you know again going back to what we talked about about these congruent experiences in the past that's that's creating an atmosphere that certainly has something to do with with the food but going even deeper um, and beginning to think about, uh, you know, are, if you're, you know, a retail space where your specialty is cupcakes and sweets, uh, you know, playing music that has uh, higher pitches, um, you know, that has a little faster uh, attack that may kind of create an environment that sounds sweeter. Or perhaps you're a coffee shop. Uh, and you have this smell of the roast coffee, you know, maybe you want to look for music that uh, could be a little slower, uh, a little more legato, uh, a little bit more lower in pitch uh, that creates this experience that enhances the flavor and the aroma. So it's, but really it's not harmonizing just, the two together. Exactly. And, and so, but within a, in a restaurant or retail environment, we don't, just think about the playlist. You have to think about the other sounds as well. You know, you talked about, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier the, the sound of sizzling onions. Uh, well, part of having an open kitchen uh, or part of bringing a dish and preparing it table side uh, is this opportunity to have this theater where you can he actually hear the sizzling or mm. hear these, these sounds, uh, which is a very important part of the experience. You know, we found from research that you take all of those sounds out of the atmosphere and the food just doesn't taste quite as good. Um, well, I have to say, I'm just thinking, when you say sounds of the restaurant, I immediately think of that kind of, you know, the din of a restaurant room when it's kind of busy right. and you've got the glasses clanking and the cutlery uh -huh. going and the plateware and just that din of voices around you. There's something uh, that I really enjoy about that kind of atmosphere. And yes. even I can think of at our chef's tables when you have, you know, all the guests around the table and there's just that kind of din um, right. And then there's the silence when the dish is served and there's that moment of just kind of when everyone's enjoying and there's a bit of uh, focus on the food. But there, there is, I guess, very few places really think about um, even managing that other than the acoustics of maybe having too much, let's say, echo or whatever it may be. But in the design sure. of restaurants, yes. and the, the concept and theme, I guess we don't see as many examples of sound being used in that way to create, to curate the atmosphere. Right. And, it, and again, that comes back to intention. Uh, and this aspect of noise, if you will, is also an important consideration. You know, it, the number one complaint about restaurants is usually not the quality of the food. It's usually the noise in the environment. Um, and, there is a real impact, not only just on the experience, we've also learned that in really noisy environments, um, your flavor sense tends to be uh, dulled, 
Uh, and so as a result, you know, you may not be experiencing the flavor that's really there in the food. We also tend to eat more in, in noisy restaurants. So, you know, there might be some proprietors that immediately think, oh, that's great. I just turn up the volume. People are going to order more and eat more. But the other side of that coin is, yeah, but then you make it really noisy and you're not going to enjoy the experience. And so to that point, there are restaurants that look at, you know, how can we treat walls? Um, let's look at the sounds that add to the experience, but try and remove the sounds that might be distracting to the experience. Um, we have a few restaurants here in the Bay Area um, that have uh, sound systems that are installed uh, that were developed by uh, a husband and wife team called the Myers. And Meyer Sound started basically um, creating sound systems for uh, for touring bands and then eventually got into larger PA systems. Uh, but they're foodies. Uh, they, they love food. And so they developed a system that's uh, uh, an array of microphones and speakers uh, set up um, with a software in an iPad where you can literally change the acoustical shape of the room by how you're changing sound coming in through the microphones. Uh, you can take the conversation from each table and then beam it back down to the table so that wow. people can hear each other. Because again, another kind of fascinating uh, cocktail fodder uh, is um, uh, something called the Lombard effect. The Lombard effect says that in order for us to hear each other in a conversation, uh, our conversation needs to be about five to six dB above the noise floor. The noise floor is just whatever's going on in the background. So if that noise floor begins to, to, to rise, what happens? Well, we have to talk a little louder because we have to get, right. get the dB up there. And as we talk louder, we add to the noise floor. And before too long, there's this cacophony. So we can el electronically manage that um, in spaces. Uh, and it's amazing. It's amazing to, to you know, it, it's very subtle. We might not realize it until we look up and say, oh, that's, that's interesting. Those aren't just speakers. What is that? Um, but, uh, you know, it's having an implicit effect that we don't realize. And then we can kind of get off into the woods about how, you know, certain playlists may have an effect on what we're ordering off of the menu. Um, could we have people ordering Whoa. healthier food, depending on what we're playing? Um, and, and so it, it, it really is interesting when you start pulling back the layers, everything that's there. And I think uh, you touched on a few things there that are really, really fascinating. And so one about um, the, I guess, idea of if you're playing Something like I think there was research. There was research done um, in a supermarket showing that I believe if it was French music playing in the background in the wine aisle, that the wine. more French mm -hmm. wines were bought, and if more German, I think it was Belka music or something, yeah. um, was playing, that more German wines were purchased. Right. So it's interesting how when just even and, and, and the interesting thing about that research was that the people who took part said that they hadn't noticed. I mean, that, that, yeah. they, they, their decision, they felt at least that their decision wasn't mediated by what it was that they uh, were listening to. And so exactly. do you think it's possible then to kind of guide people maybe or, or to have an impact on people when they're ordering uh, from a menu that maybe you could nudge them towards eating maybe the healthier options? Is there, well, because I'm thinking of how would this apply into schools as well? I'm just thinking mm -hmm. kids in a canteen, is there a way of, kind of having these sonic cues or nudges that would potentially encourage people to make more nutritious, more sustainable, healthier, whatever it may be, food choices? Certainly. And I think, you know, what, what you're talking about is, is moving from, uh, you know, strictly the idea of perception and now moving into behavior, you know, and, and we know that those two things are, are, are tied, uh, that if we, um, you know, the, the way we perceive the world uh, around us certainly has an impact on how we behave towards it. Uh, and so this idea of, as, as you called it, nudging um, that can happen when we kind of perform these sensory hacks. You know, we're talking about sound, but you could do this um, in a lot of, of different ways. Mm. But, um, you know, by 
by playing a, a particular sound that might focus you on something. Uh, whether it's the sound of, of chickens or the sound of cows or the sound of nature uh, in the background. Uh, again, the tempo um, of things, how fast something is or how slow it is could kind of nudge you towards, you know, an association between eating quickly or taking your time. You know, we've, we've seen how, um, you know, people will tend to begin to chew their food uh, in a, a rhythm to something that they're listening mm. to uh, in the background. We've seen um, that uh, in terms of consumption, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, in things that are really loud, you, you tend to eat more. We found that if you're wearing earplugs, um, you know, that you might tend to, to consume up to 30% less in calories. So, you know, there's your wow. sonic diet tip. Uh, really? you know, and, and part of that is, uh, you know, I think because if you're eating with earplugs and you're getting in tune with your own mastication, um, which is something we, we don't think about, we're not aware very often, uh, as we're eating food, the process of eating it. Mm. Um, but also there are less distractions. So we're in tune probably more with our bodies. Uh, and when we're aware that we're satiated, that feels like enough, uh, we're able to step away. When we're distracted with all kinds of other sonic or sensory cues around us, um, you know, we may be primed to simply keep eating because we're not paying attention as much to, to what's, what's going on. So you think about these applications, not just in restaurants, but move into um, healthcare, uh, which, you know, these days it's not a, a far jump from hospitality to healthcare. We're looking at you know, ways that we can create experiences that are, are much better and that the research has shown impacts the, the, the outcome. Um, and so you think about uh, hospital cafeterias, you think about meal times in hospitals and things that you might actually do with these sensory hacks that could be of, of benefit um, that aren't simply about always relying on on pharma. You know, a diabetic. Oh, I can't have the sugar in my food. Well, could we put sweetness back with uh, a little bit of a playlist um, as you're you're eating your your dessert? Or a a, a patient who's dealing with um, a chronic treatment like chemotherapy that may really change their sensory perception. Well, maybe there are things that we can do with sound to, to bring back those senses or at least heighten senses in a different way to bring back part of the experience of eating and food that they've, they've lost in that, that process. Um, and that's where, you know, the real motivation is for me in this. You know, I mean, yes, I work in advertising. And so there's, there's obviously looking at, at these hacks from from an advertising or marketing perspective, but just in terms of these sonic interventions that are powerful enough, I think, to, to really do good um, in, in the world and trying to harness it uh, for, for that. Well, it's fascinating, and I'd say it would be for most people listening, this idea of how sound has, number one, can have an impact on flavor, but how you mentioned earlier about the kind of physiological impact that sound can have on if it's too loud. Um, and I believe it's somewhere kind of upwards of 70 uh, decibels that your perception of sweetness and saltiness are in, in some way uh, inhibited mm -hmm. or reduced. Yes. And what a lot of this kind of sounds like, because you could say, well, would I perceive that? Would I be aware of it? And I guess on an aeroplane, you're aware of food maybe lacking in flavor because of the kind of all the cabin noise pollution that you have, right? And all that kind of stuff around you. But I guess kind of from hearing even the way you're talking about this, a lot of it has to do with kind of mindfulness, right? And just being yes. mindful of that, of those senses. So, you know, whether it's uh, putting the po uh, ear pods in and, <clears throat> and eating, which is making you more mindful of um, the crunching and mastication, whether it's, um, uh, I guess there are other ways of 
I guess maybe the music in and of itself is drawing your attention maybe into the flavor, into the foods or intensifying them in some way, like what we said with the spiciness. Mm -hmm. And so I guess a lot of this does come down to maybe the sonic seasoning, let's say, um, in some way making people more mindful about certain flavors or making it more salient in their minds in some way. I, yeah. yeah, it's just interesting because I guess it's one of those things where the, the um, being mindful of what we do is kind of lacking when it comes to food. And so it's interesting to think that audio, because people aren't being as mindful over kind of where their food comes from, uh, how processed right. it is, how, yeah. you know, uh, that um, we're more mindful of how much it costs and how quick it is to get into us in some way. And yeah. so to think that audio could be used as a way of making people more mindful. I guess a good example would be, and maybe you could kind of talk about it from your side, is the jellyfish dish that we worked on mm -hmm. together. Because what fascinated me about this was jellyfish really tastes of pretty much nothing, and it depends on how you marinate it. But if you ask people, and I have gone all over the world asking people about this, what's their number one concern of eating, let's say something like jellyfish, um, in, in Eastern, Far Eastern countries, um, people eat it regularly-ish. So if we're talking about places like China and Japan and uh, Korea and places like that, something like jellyfish they eat and they'll say it's crunchy. But when you ask people in the West, they'll say, well, their first kind of association would be that it would be slippery, slimy, and right. not so pleasant of a texture. And it was that idea of how do we get people to enjoy the texture of mm -hmm something like jellyfish and this is where this is where you came in <laughs> yeah well and you know again i think one of the things that you do so well is you know really help us understand um a narrative around food if you will you know that that the experiences uh at your chef's table are storytelling experiences you know, you take us on a journey uh, that really highlights these rituals um, of eating. You know, and if you think about ritual from a religious standpoint, a ritual is something that's designed to, you know, bring you to a point where, you know, you are in the moment with something. Uh, and, and I think that's what happens with eating. And to your point, very often we've lost the sense of, you know, what is a, is a ritual. And specifically with, uh, you know, crunchy jellyfish, uh, sound was uh, a really great sensory hack um, because we could play with um, some of the sounds kind of being uh, this ambient wash, uh, the sound of almost like bubbles that are echoing up that are creating this, you know, sense of being underwater and the sea, which again is very congruent with with the jellyfish. But then we laid over top of that um, crunching sounds um, that were almost, you know, kind of keying into this um, autosensory meridian response, ASMR, uh, where, where, you know, kind of brings about chills in, in some people. But we had combined sounds, some of it were, were you know, literally someone mic'd up and the sounds of them eating something that you could hear the crunch. But then there were other sounds like walking through snow and kind of that crunch of snow underneath, you know, or, or crumbling something a little bit. And these were kind of interspersed uh, in, in somewhat of a, of a rhythm um, that was designed to be pleasant and relaxing. And so as people were eating the jellyfish, they could taste some of the the natural crunch that you had put in there as a chef, but then we played with that texture by combining that texture and that crunch experience in their mouth with what we were putting in their ears. Um, and it really created an entirely yeah. different experience for them where there was nothing, you know, slimy or gelatous uh, about that experience, even though, um, you know, if, if we were to focus on some of that, we probably could have drawn some of those textures out as well. But that's just one example of how um, 
we were all working together collaboratively um, in our areas of expertise uh, in a way that we wanted to create an experience for the people that were enjoying that ritual of eating in that moment. Uh, and I think we were, were really successful. And, um, you know, it's just oh, been thrilling really for me to from... be to be part of, of that, you know, experience and to, to be able to create those kinds of things with you. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I love um, about our 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 friendship is not only can we have long chats at the dinner table after we're finished with the meal, but we can actually create together in really fun uh, and interesting, interesting ways. Yeah. And, and I mean, the success of that jellyfish dish has been incredible because we've served that now to easily a few thousand people um, over the years uh, with that soundscape um, uh, playing for them. And the reactions that you get over time, it's interesting when you see consistency, right, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, responses that you get. Now, one of, the main, one of the most interesting things for me is that in, let's say, since I think this, we did this research around 2016, didn't we, when it was published, yes. the Jellyfish Papers maybe published a little bit after that, but I think it came onto the menu by 2016. And what was fascinating was that we took the one element that people were most uh, concerned about when it came to jellyfish, which is texture. And rather than looking at texture in the mouth, we addressed it through, I guess, how you perceive texture in the ear and the crunching. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that was number one, what was interesting about it is that's quite a smart way of kind of going around it. Number two, I think it's interesting because you're actually taking the one thing that people are most concerned about and actually making that the highlight in some way yes. of yes. The, the dish. So you're, you're, you're taking texture and the whole dish was about texture and all the complementary ingredients that went with the jellyfish were about texture. And this was all designed around that soundscape that um, uh, had been developed for it. And We've had so many people over time try the dish with the headphones on, try it without the headphones. And it's, un it's just undoubtable that the majority of people will tell you that it makes their experience of the dish more pleasurable when listening to that music. Now, as well, they've factored into it the whole thing that maybe it's slightly relaxing the music. So if mm -hmm. they are a bit nervous about eating something like jellyfish, this kind of... Um, uh, calms them down, let's say, a little bit, or, or makes them feel more at ease in some way. The crunching, so many people have talked about the crunching, whether at some point they're not sure whether they're hearing the crunching from the audio right. track or whether it's coming <laughs> from them. And there's almost this kind right. of ventriloquist thing going on in their minds where they're not exactly sure where the crunching is coming from, but whatever's going on, this is really crunchy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such an interesting example of how... Uh, kind of audio design behind a dish can actually, because the whole reason that we did this, and to be clear for, I guess, those who are uh, watching is the jellyfish are considered one of the most sustainable ingredients uh, that we can eat from the sea. And it's even said that there could be a net positive effect with eating ingredients like jellyfish. But generally, there's a negative perception that's accompanied with the idea of jellyfish. And it was amazing that through kind of finding the right way of designing the course, the flavors obviously have to be there. It tastes, well, I'm going to say this, even though we developed the dish, but it tastes great. Yes, um, it does. But I don't know if that's always enough for people, but the audio uh, component is definitely what maybe got people into the right state, shall we say, to be mm -hmm. willing to try this and to be willing to enjoy it in a way. And I think it's, it's just, for me, a great uh, case study of how, that, uh, how audio can actually get people enjoying a more sustainable, introduce them to a more sustainable type of food. And don't forget uh, you know, the, the fact that you had projection mapped the table as well. Oh, so, but not in all cases. Ah, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, we've done this over the years. Like, yeah, if it was just, if it was all done at our chef's table and it was all projection mapped, yeah, I agree that that could be a component that definitely factors into it if Plays you have to see it, yeah. shimmering in front of you mm -hmm. but no when we first started the dish and even when we've done it in events outside of the studio we haven't had the projection mapping and people equally yeah. find it as 
engaging, if not more so, because maybe you're not distracted then by a right. shimmering well, table. Maybe you are more yeah. focused no, it's, on the it's, audio. It's nice to hear that it's as powerful uh, without some of those visual hacks that you know we're, we're, we're doing at the chef's table when you have the table projection map. Yeah. yeah. So one, uh, we're kind of getting to time, and I don't want to take up much more of your time, Steve. One of the projects that we had worked on was uh, looking at flavors within uh, whiskey. Mm -hmm. And we had designed, um, was it five or six? It was five. So five. The, the, five the, single the malts. Five single malts. And the idea was, uh, without kind of mentioning any brands, so the idea behind this whiskey um, uh, soundscape that we developed was the brand wanted to talk about uh, multisensory, uh, oh, sorry, the, the brand wanted to talk about the art of blending, wasn't it? That yes. was it. And yes. they brought us in because they wanted to look at the art of blending through a multisensory kind of lens or perspective. And when I heard and went to visit their distillery and saw how the whiskey was blended using these five single malts, that really, I guess, you know, some of when people think of blended malt whiskies, I guess in many cases they think, well, you take each one of the five in equal parts and kind of mix them in together and Bob's your uncle. Whereas in fact, it's actually a very delicate balance between mm -hmm. some of the whiskies that are providing that initial taste and that kind of maybe vibrancy on the tongue, some of the, the kind of main body and heart of, the, of uh, the flavor, and some maybe that are more aromatic and uh, maybe have more of an aftertaste and lingering kind of notes to them. Yes. And they blend that very carefully. And my initial kind of thought was that this is a being as a chef is it kind of struck me that, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I guess it's the same as if you took five pieces of music, you couldn't just play all five over one another and expect them to sound good. But we understand that with music more than we do. Like if you have a DJ, it makes a lot more sense what they're doing when they're blending music than when you have a master blender at a distillery. And yes. so that's then how you and I started working on this. And we... Uh, had designed tasters that they were going to uh, taste along the way as they tried mm -hmm. each of the five single malts until they got to this last, uh, the drink of the actual uh, complete um, uh, malted whiskey blend in itself. How did you take, how did you capture the, and I have to say from having traveled all over the world and delivering this um, uh, uh, tasting experience, it was a huge success. And it would be interesting. And one thing that people kept asking me about was how was it that we kind of reflected the character and personality of each of the single malts and encapsulated them into um, a piece of music? Yeah. What was it that went behind that? Well, you know, again, I would say uh, this is a prime example of what I call audio alchemy. Um, you know, that kind of blend of science and art. So part of it, the, the science bit was looking at some of the play, flavor profiles of the individual malts. You know, some of them, uh, I, you know, trying to remember them off the top of my head, I think uh, one was uh, spicy. Uh, there was another that was floral. Uh, there was one and that fruity, was- fruity, I think. Fruity. Uh, yeah. There was creamy. Um, and so, you know, all of these are- flavor words and flavor profiles that actually do track really well to sonic ingredients. Um, and we knew from the research what some of those sonic ingredients were, you know, creamy. Again, we would want the, the notes to kind of blend together, be long, maybe be a little lower. Um, you know, we knew with, with something that was uh, fruity, that there were these higher pitched sounds. And those are similar to, to floral, but we did some other things with floral kind of blending in some soundscapes, the sound of birds in the, in the, in the background or kind of a, a walk through a, through a meadow, um, if you will. Uh, and spiciness the same way. So we we started there with those sonic ingredients. Um, you know, we got creative. We took a look at um, some of the ways in which these uh, single malts were prepared. I think there was one in particular that was done in copper kettles. So we actually blended in some rhythm that with the sound of, you know, kind of copper um, beating against things. Um, and, and so we created these 
soundscapes um, that were built on sonic profiles to match the flavor profiles. Um, but as artists, we had to also think about how do all of these things work together? So we created these motifs, but created them in a way that we knew that harmonically they would all fit. So when we got to the last piece, which was the blend of these five together that we literally called an opus, um, we had crafted these tracks in a way that they all fit and actually were designed to match um, what the, uh, the, the distillers were telling us was actually the journey that this takes um, on your palate. You know, what hits it first? What is that part of the single malt that you first will taste? And then what's the next one that comes through? And what's the one that lingers? And so we constructed the opus to take you on that journey as well. So there was the sound science, you know, that, that you definitely could, could hear and taste, if you will, and the single malts. Um, but then there was the art of pulling all of those together in, in an opus in a way that told you the flavor story uh, of all of it. And you combine that with, you know, your brilliance of what you brought in with the different aromas, the different um, elements of things that they were literally tasting alongside of uh, the, the whiskey components. And you created a a wonderful experience that makes quite an impression. And for that particular brand, that was the whole idea, um, you know, to create an experience that gets people talking, sharing uh, about it and enhances their, um, their relationship and their view of the, the product and the taste. So it was, it was an amazing, uh, amazing opportunity to do something really interesting and, and fun. I keep hoping one day that we'll actually get a live orchestra <laughs> to, do the, to do the opus. So two quick things before we go then. One would be, um, what do you think is, what would you be excited about researching in this kind of world of flavor sounds? Is there anything you're working on or anything that you'd like to work on or that you've thought of over the last year? Because I know every time we catch up, we always have new ideas about what should be researched and you know what we'd like to do. So first of all, anything in that kind of, uh, anything that you're working on at the moment or anything that you've recently found of interest? Well, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> I think the, the more we get into, uh, you know, wearables um, and, and biometrics, you know, the ways that we can, um, understand what is going on with our bodies and are there things that we can do with sound that are part of those nudges. Um, you know, I, I think as I am really drawn these days to understanding sound in healthcare environments and in terms of nutrition and what are some of the things that we can do there that would be helpful. Um, certainly uh, in this time of pandemic, uh, you know, where we're, we're stuck indoors, um, where people are probably eating at home a lot more. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are ways that maybe we can bring some of these sensory elements, uh, you know, to bear, you know, saying, uh, you know, Alexa, um, play my uh, Italian dinner playlist, you know, uh, play my crunchy jellyfish playlist, um, you know. And, and so I think that idea of bringing some of those things home uh, are really uh, exciting to me. Uh, and beyond that, it's just the ability to, to find ex experiences to, to play, to push the, the technology, to push the knowledge, um, you know, and so that's why, particularly with, with you and, and Charles, I love this kind of triumvirate of the, the three of us that can, you know, dream uh, around a, a pint or two uh, in a in a pub, uh, and then see it come to life uh, at a table where people are sitting around enjoying the experience and see their eyes open wide um, because it really is magic that that yeah. we're doing. You know, truly. and one final question then, which is, uh, and this is kind of putting you on the spot, but you've already mentioned a few of these kind of things, so I'm sure you'll have them to hand, but um, top tips for someone who is a chef or in hospitality or 
uh, and the hospitality in it could be hotels, could be restaurants, could be <clears throat> um, chefs' tables that wanted to incorporate sound in some way. What would be your top kind of tip or a couple of bits of advice that they should? Uh, what, 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 how, where should they look, or what should they sure. uh, look to do? I would say the very first thing is to open your ears. It all starts with listening. You know, it's it's not about oh, let me just throw some sound into an environment. Stop and listen to your environment to start with. You know, how does it how does it sound? Um, you know, are there things that are distracting? Are there sounds that you think maybe should be there that you're that you're not hearing? So just by listening, kind of getting in tune with, you know, what you're listening, I think that's, that's the first piece. And then the next piece is beginning to come up with these ideas that make your use of sound more intentional. And part of that could simply be, uh, you know, as you're preparing a dish, what would you listen to? You know, what, what is a sonic inspiration for something that you're creating? And it may be that, in that experience, you find an element that you can then bring and share at the table um, with with diners. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this is science, but it's not necessarily rocket science. It really is simply um, begins with with paying attention, and then beyond that, uh, I would say there's plenty of uh, research that's been done now in this field. So start reading, you know, Google kitchen theory, Google Charles Spence. I would say Google me, but that seems a little self-serving. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, you, you will find um, plenty of, uh, of inspiration. Uh, and then it's just doing what you naturally do, you know, bringing it into what you love um, as a, as a chef, um, you know, just being a little bit more of a sonic chef as, you, as you're well, doing. To pick up on one thing that you said about the whole listening to your environment. And as you were saying that, I was saying that's really interesting because, you know, one of the, I wouldn't say worse, but one of the poorer restaurant experiences I once had here in London was the most memorable, one of the most memorable aspects of the dining experience that I can remember were the staff the sound of their shoes on the hardwood floor. And every time they were approaching the table, you'd hear pom, 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 pom. And there was about, they, they kind of over-serviced tables in the sense of at least two people would approach the table each time they approached. And all you could hear was this stampede every time and they were walking across to other people's tables. And it is interesting to think about just curating, as you said, that you're going to make noise in a restaurant but just being mindful of, right, what are those noises and how can we curate that a bit more so that it kind of fits in line with exactly what we're looking for as an experience. That's fascinating. Yes, yes. Steve, so how can people find out more? They can go to your TED Talk, which is fantastic and talks about more than just kind of what we've covered here, but um, any anywhere else that they can go for more information? Uh, well, Certainly, they can go to the Kitchen Theory website and follow the menu over to find the Think Tank, uh, where you have a lovely little bit about me there. Uh, on Twitter, that's always a good place uh, because I'm fairly active on Twitter, so you can look for me there. It's audioalchemist underscore. Don't forget the underscore uh, at the end. And I'm very often uh, posting things that interest me, uh, research that uh, you know I've I've been working on. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Google as, as well, um, you know, we'll, we'll bring about a number of, uh, different things, uh, and LinkedIn. I don't have a website of my own. Um, so no, no, no places I can send you to there. I'm not that important. Well, no, but it's, it's your, your, your Twitter feed is constantly kept up to date and has loads of interesting stuff that you share. So I definitely yeah. recommend everyone, uh, follow you on that. Steve. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time today to join us on the, on the show. You are welcome. It's always lovely to chat with you. So thanks for taking time out to do that with me.